Welcome to the Estate Professionals Mastermind Podcast. This community is about providing value first, and rather than having one interaction, one transaction, and one payday from the work you do, we're here to teach you to build so much more. First of all, Chad, thanks for everything you do. I think I can probably speak for everybody on this call, but you're a great mentor and I've learned a lot from taking well, both of your courses. So thank you. Welcome everybody to the weekly probate mastery group coaching call and the estate professionals mastermind podcast. I'm the guest here now. Thanks to Bill Gross, who's uh, normally hosting you guys. He has the week off. I want to talk about one thing before we get started is the estateprofessional.org. If you're not familiar with that, it's a directory we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and we've kind of soft launched it to make sure we're not going to have problems and we have the technology the way we want that. What's been really neat is just with the first few dozen people in, we're already seeing referrals. So we have already had members, uh, certified probate experts connect with attorneys out of state. So we're seeing those, those B2B connections already. And obviously in the beginning, you can expect it's going to be more B2B until we've actually gotten it out to the consumers, at which point it becomes B to C. So that's where it's important right now as, as a resource to us professionally, the more of the more of our teams that we have in there, the more professionals we have, the more business we get them, the more they give back to us and vice versa. So just a reminder, if you haven't set your estateprofessional.org profile up, it is there, it is free. You do have premium placement as a certified probate expert. And we can talk about my big, hairy, audacious goals for that and where, where we think it's headed later. But we have, we do believe it can be an extremely valuable resource for us, B2B and B2C. To do a really good profile, it probably takes you a half an hour. And I see at least a few of you in here that do already have profiles. And thanks for, for doing that and being an early adopter. Kind of cool to see, you know, leads roll through and actual connections made and, and get, you know, be able to, to be the bridge between you guys. So other than that, I don't have much. Who's got a success story, a struggle, anything they want to share, anything working or not working? Anyone not doing the work you know you should be and you need to get well, butt have... kicking by your peers? Hi, this is Mina. I have a question. How are you? Well, I know you, you were messaging me and I've been like busy with everything, but I'm in, I'm in with Keller Williams in Los Angeles and uh, Arizona, Phoenix. Uh, so uh, with the support of Keller Williams in the South Bay, we opened up a trust and probate division. Yeah. So it looks grander. It's not just me. Uh, but, you know, I find that, and I think it's probably Los Angeles. I find that, you know, I, I connect with attorneys and, you know, I don't know an eloquent way because they want to come and speak in my office, right? Which is great. But how do I say, oh, well, if you give me business, <laughs> I'll let you come speak. What's a nice way to say it? I don't, I, I think yes is probably the nicest way to say it. And, you know, just like, don't have such high expectations that they owe you something like just make sure, you know, you could put it as, yeah, that'd be great. Like what, what topic would you like to, to present? And then just leave it at that, put the onus on them to say, here's how we can provide value to your audience. You know, it's interesting. I have a radio show also, and I've had some attorneys on there, like a real radio yeah. show. And uh, do you know how they haven't sent me anything? I have them on my show and they haven't sent me anything. You have know? you followed up? I, have you talked to them since the show? Yeah, you know, I have. And okay. I don't know if they're just small or, I, I, you know, I don't know. I think they're doing a lot of networking also. Are you a direct and person? So, mm -hmm. Are you? Are you a I, I could be. Yeah, I, I, I mean, would like to. I would, but... Have you taken the earn course? The which one? Earn the this one. No. I would encourage you to look there. I shared all of my best ideas in that course of how to actually get authentic connections with attorneys, uh -huh. and I think you'll you'll get some ideas of how to reconnect with those those folks. But in that course, in the first hell probably two hours. I really show you what the industry looks like from a macro to a micro standpoint. Right. 
So they've right. taken on a quarter million dollars worth of debt. They're taking a fiduciary position with every client. They're having the same conversation over and over and over. And every real estate professional that approaches them comes with a handout saying, me, 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 give, give, give. Right. Right. And they come in. So this, this whole, the whole point of this course is to help you be empathetic to their position, not as an attorney, but as a small business owner and to really find ways for your small business to support their small business. So right. I'm not here to promote my own course, but I, what no, I would no, say, no, I understand. Need, yeah. You need to find a way to reconnect with them with a, you know, a, a question you, you can uh, start by, you know, ask them a question like, how, how's your business going in 22 is, do you have all the business you need and how can I help you reach that goal? If not right. things right. like that, just reconnect with them. Cause you've right. already, you've already provided value to them. And yes. I'll, I'll challenge you. It's, it's, you know, we're all here to, we're in business to do business, yes. but in order to get the right mindset and in, in approaching them for a second time, I'll challenge you to change your mindset that they don't owe you anything. You did something professionally that, that supported them. That's great. You built some social capital. You might not have cashed in on it yet, but right. if you proceed with the mindset of they're going to pay me back eventually, I better check in and see how they're doing and what else I can do for right. them. I think you'll find they're, you know, they're buried. And then we talk a lot about what I call administrative drag in the earn course. 90% of their days are spent doing redundant, like repetitive, redundant administrative tasks wow. and having the same conversation over and over. One of the things we're doing in the background that I don't think I've actually spoken about publicly, but what the hell, we're actually looking at building consumer facing courses taught by attorneys where we'll be able to actually give like give you a license to those that you can give those to your attorney. So they don't have to hire a course production crew and do all the homework wow. to help educate their incoming clients. Instead of having a three hour conversation about the same five, the same thing they've done five times today already, right. we'll give them an actual digital course to onboard their clients. So their clients will come to that first appointment fully prepared and ready to roll with all the documents organized uh -huh. the way they want. It's going to take some that time. That'll be in 20 in 23. Like, but that's happening now that's being produced in the background. And ideally with the intent of having that be, have 50 versions of it potentially where we have an attorney from every state as a state, you know, a state level representative to stand behind that education, client education. But until then, the earn course gives you some ideas of how you can actually reduce administrative drag in a law firm so you can be right. received very differently. But also, more importantly, once you've kind of began one of those relationships, there's actionable steps like the way for them to, to point business back. So, but I would, you know, if someone was asking, if an attorney is asking a real estate professional to speak to their audience, the answer is yes every time. But yeah. it's, Absolutely. What topic would you like to speak on? And if it's, you know, me and how to send referrals to me, be like, yeah, that's kind of like, that's not very strong. Let's, let's put our heads together. We can come up with something that's really good. And then you can archive that content and actually maybe put it out to your actual consumer prospects and say, you know, we had the opportunity of having a California or an Arizona probate attorney in our office. And this is something that we, we, we're going to repurpose this and make it, you know, make it valuable to the consumers as well as your agents. Right. Right. So uh, just, I mean, off the top of my head, like if, if they do both planning and administration, let's, you know, let's do 15 minutes of speaking on planning, 15 minutes of speaking on the pains of administration, mm -hmm. and then 15 minutes on how you can avoid all the problems that were discussed. That way your agents are empathetic to what the clients are going through and you have a piece of content that's valuable to the clients that you can use to promote your own business. Right. Right. So right, use them right. as, use the, use the talent. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I also create a trust and probate page on Facebook. Yeah. So I don't know if groups are better than pages or pages are better than groups to promote to the public because I want to do lives on there. The page is great for the first, the top of the funnel. So for the public to find you, 
the group is better for the public to stay engaged with you for a wow. way a way for you to communicate so use the page to get the group noticed use the group to market and communicate and, and actually nurture the relationship got it so i can put the group in the page yeah and again in this course that's one of the ideas that okay. I'll, i expand and kind of show you how to create a community group Ooh. with your vendor team so every week you're producing content to help rope them in so you would start by creating a page with your brand and create a group for your for that and i would imagine you might have two groups you might have the los angeles group right. and, and the phoenix right. group yes and then you have the butcher the baker the candlestick maker come and speak on topics that are valuable to consumers so you get your estate planning attorney you get your estate administration you get somebody who works with you know with uh asset protection or spendthrift trust for your high net worth clients in LA and, and Phoenix, just anyone that can bring value, social workers, care managers, uh, right. se senior placement agencies. Yes, yes. So anytime somebody's Googling what my mom is, you know, dad died, mom needs a safe yeah. place to live. Like they'll find that group or they'll find the page and eventually find the group. Do you have any VAs that are good at moderating or helping with all this social media stuff that know the industry? I have Kat and she's right. my right arm and all of this. Yes. So my advice would be to find yourself someone like Kat, someone who shares your values that actually cares about this conversation and this community, right. and they'll pour themselves into it like she does. I think people you know, not maliciously, but I get a lot of, a, a lot of credit for what she does. A lot of it is her because her heart's in it. She cares about this community and the consumer impact. So VAs are attractive because it's three or four bucks an hour, but I would say invest in somebody like Kat, invest in somebody locally that can see the passion you have, that can see right. the reason and the purpose behind your work and you'll never have to manage them. Cat always hides on these calls, but ah, ask her, well, ask maybe, her how many she knows, maybe she knows someone <laughs> that uh, would be open to, you know, learning the culture of this and helping me out. So, so one thing I'll say is, you know, look at, look at agents who are struggling in your market, but have done a good job with their social media presence. Oh, that's there's, interesting. There's a lot of those. So they probably are struggling because they spent too much time working on that first. Right. And, you know, but there's, it's, it's not hard to find agents with really beautiful branding and a social presence and posting multiple videos a day and busting wow. their ass, but they didn't build a client base first. They, right. they let, they led with that when that should have been supplementary right. to other things that are more proven, right. More, uh, yeah. more dollar productive. Yeah. So. We know that we have an 88% failure rate in the brokerage side of the industry and in, within the first three years. So well, why not find someone who's already well-versed in real estate, wow. has, has a license, has the social media skill set and say, hey, how about a solid base and my mentorship? Right. You can be my social media manager and I'll mentor you if you still want to stay in production. You're in my downline. I'll mentor you. I like it. So recruit Perfect. someone who's struggling at a different company. I mean, that's what you guys do. I mean, yeah. you're recruiters, right? Recruiters. So go grab somebody with a be beautiful, beautiful social media presence and three closed deals last year. There's your target. I love it. Okay. Thank you so much, Chad. Yeah. Vince, how can we help you, sir? Yeah. First of all, Chad, thanks for everything you do. I think I can probably speak for everybody on this call, but you're a great mentor and I've learned a lot from taking both of your courses. So thank you. Thank the you. The question thank is, you. I have a variety of, uh, I'll call them subcontractors that are just basically people that I use to have work done and they're insured. But sometimes I wonder if left alone to their own devices, if I'm not there, should they also be bonded? Do you think that's a good idea or is that just overkill? Uh, are you, are you speaking from the GC role? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, just like you, I do the real estate. I also do the appraisal. I'm a certified appraiser. Uh, those things never cross, but you know, you can't do one with the other, but say you're clean out people or your handyman people or that kind of thing. I was just wondering if maybe bonding them 
would be overkill or whether they're whether just being insured is good enough it's it's always been good enough for me what i find is is the more requirements you have the less options you have right in in that in that particular area finding somebody who's bonded and insured and also a good self-managing contractor you know they're probably a gc <laughs> not not a sub right so it's it's a pretty tight filter what i would recommend is just just make sure you've got the right policies in place on your gc company and that you've got an umbrella and you're probably fine working the way you are I just make subs show me proof of insurance. And if they're working on a house that I own, I make them name me as a, additionally insured. I still get letters from insurance companies, from contractors from hell years ago, because they never rolled me off the list. So I get a copy of their policy every time it renews. And I just, I did that with everyone. That was part of the requirement is you, you add me on, on your policy as additional insured. So I can see that your policy is current. That way, I knew at least every six months that the guys I was working with or were working for me, that they had, you know, had active policies. And I, I never had any trouble. In today's labor market, you can't be too damn choosy. It's, it's pulling teeth. I've been working since February to get a well drilled and uh, HVAC, uh, radiant floor HVAC installed. And I'm still, this is, I've never been stuck this long, but I'm in an extremely rural area. And I've offered to <laughs> offered to buy a brand new well drilling rig if a guy would come and show up and drill, and it still didn't work. So it's uh, you kind of have to take what you can get right now. Yeah, that's true. In some sectors, I have a, a tremendous redundancy in people that I can call to have certain things done, and in other places, it's a black hole. There's just nothing there. What market are you in? I'm in rural southeastern Ohio. We're all yeah. neighbors. What yeah. redundancy do you have? Send them over here. I'll make them rich. We have <laughs> no tradesmen here. Well, I don't know where they travel down to where you're at. Beckley, I don't think they'd go that far, quite frankly. I'm near Snowshoe. I'll give them a farmhouse to live in and a pickup to drive. Send them. <laughs> Craig, we just drove by you. We were in uh, uh, South Carolina. As a matter of fact, they came ashore right where we were vacationing. So we got the H out of there, but yeah, we drove right by you. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Well, if tell them if they need work, come to Snowshoe. I mean, we like, it doesn't matter. Any tradesman, an HVAC guy, you can print money here. You can name your price because there's just so few. So, all right. Looking at the comments, Kat's getting all kinds of love over there. That's awesome. Mina Renee Kishi, who is on here, Hollywood Renee? I don't see uh, Yes, yes, we've been connected. I just messaged each. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Lynette said CRS is adding a probate certification. Great. Have you taken it, Lynette? No, it's not supposed to be available till like November, but I just thought it was interesting that they were adding that certification. Just one yeah. more thing that people can add to their... We, uh, I actually talked with, I talked with them about it back in 2018 or 19. I was wondering if you were involved with it. <laughs> they want, they want half your company. And I would rather, mm. I would rather contribute that money to the payroll of awesome team members than I would to one of the biggest lobbyists in the United States. So for me, it made more sense to actually put that back into the community than to put it into those coffers that I already paid dues into. Mm hmm so uh, it'll be interesting to see who their instructor is and, and what results they've gotten. Hopefully it adds value to our community and it brings awareness to it. I mean, guys, we're looking at 70.3 million baby boomers that will go through this, this transition in life in the next 40 years. There is a lot of, of business to go around. But more importantly, there's a lot of struggle happening like in, in that baby boomer demographic. There's families every day that are just... It's, it's it's going to be needed more and more and more. So I, anything that brings awareness to it is is a good thing in my opinion. Like the nursing home industry doesn't have a solution. Luckily, real estate does. The more we can get the word out to people and get them to raise the, their level of professionalism, then the better off the, everyone's market will be. All right. Anybody have anything else? Any 
any stories or objections anywhere you got stuck anything you've done recently that's worked really well you want to share or willing to share just a quick question uh chad yeah has anybody had success with uh, a state exec so far any success stories with that that maybe can be shared there's been lots and lots of buzz around it I know Dan is uh, like they're they're experiencing a, an uplift in monthly users. Uh, is anyone on here responsible for that? Is it your clients that are coming through? I know, I know a lot of folks are using it. A lot of folks have gotten their their profiles in a state exec where they come up in the local checklist. Anybody on here that's actually got a success story with a state a state exec? Yeah, Brian's got one. Yeah, I. I don't know if you guys saw the video with Chad, but I come from a tech background and I lead with a state exec and it is, it has been a game changer around the DC area. It's a, it's a uh, highly technically astute area, except for the estate attorneys. So <laughs> when you tell them that you can help them with their tech and it's going to make their life easier and eliminate some of their administrative drag, it really kind of goes over their head. They know that they need something. They know that they need the help and you're providing that value to them. And I, I've led with that and have developed multiple relationships uh, just because of the state of sex so far. And I'm, and I'm hoping to do the same thing with, uh, with the state professionals because I think that that's, that takes us outside of the uh, j just that strict focus of the attorney and the PR relationship. Yeah. Have you uh, attempted anything with it that's not working, Bruce? No, I was going to present it to somebody working with an estate right now. And so the attorney and I had spoke, we met, I've got the keys to the house. And uh, there's a lot of things that should be just centralized as what that program does and just makes it easier on everybody, makes it easy on their personal representative, makes it easy on the attorney. And it also can accelerate the process because they'll have all their paperwork done quicker. So I'll give you some, I guess, just some facts that I don't think I really shared in the course, but you know, Dan, the, the, the founder and CEO of Estate Exec, he's a Harvard educated programmer. He helped build Microsoft and Google, and he's created an, an exited company successfully. He can literally build anything in the world. Like he, he has the skill set, the network, and, and he's in a position. He built this platform out of passion after losing his parents. So when you're speaking with people, you can say, listen, you know, we have exclusive access. All of our clients do. And we purchased for them a license to a software written by a Harvard educated developer that has spent multiple millions of dollars solving your biggest problem. So one thing I can assure you is the clients who come through from me as a referral will be some of the best clients you've ever had. And all I ask is an opportunity to prove that to you. So there's the backstory behind the state exec. It's not just something sexy that we could tag onto this and, and use it as a sales promo. Like it's because Dan is the right kind of person. He's the kind of person we find in this community and he's doing it for the right reasons. He could have, you know, he's, he's built software that's gotten 50,000 users up before lunchtime each day. And this is a hard road to hoe from a software standpoint, because it's something you know, just, just like what Brian said, the attorneys don't know what they need. They don't know that, that the solutions are out there. So he's, he's just like us. We haven't chosen the easiest route, but we've chosen the most fulfilling one. So you can kind of lean on, on his credentials and, and start, I mean, quite honestly, they have spent millions of dollars developing it to where it is right now. And it gets better every day. So you can kind of use that and say, you know, listen, there's, there's a guy who, who was on top of the world in software that came back down here to fix this problem and I can put it in your hands and I'll give you the best clients you've ever worked with. Great. That's a great segue. Yeah. Thank you. Mina. Yes. You can use a state exec. It is 50 state and 3,149 County compatible. They have actually done the work of working with attorneys and, and basically I won't say every, but eventually they will have specifics on every County and every state. 
So there's only 16 states. Last time I checked, there's only 16 states in the entire nation that adopted the uniform probate code that have any kind of consistency. They're typically smaller, like more rural communities. So if you live in a, in a major MSA, I'll say one of the top 50 MSAs, there's pretty much a specific probate process. And it gets and the more people, the more complicated because the more attorneys you've got involved and the more, the more, you know, legis policy has been written around it. So uh, that's one of the really, really unique things. And it looks simple on the front end, but the back end of it's a nightmare from a software standpoint is having, you know, locally specific checklists with locally vetted professionals. And that's what, you know, the direction we're moving with the stateprofessional.org is getting the community we've built here with the, with the integrity and the level of professionalism, getting that into those checklists where an executor doesn't have to struggle, like your team becomes loaded into that. So when it comes time to clean out the house, boom, you have one of your team members is suggested. When it comes time to talk about real estate, you are suggested. So that's one of the really unique things about it that, you know, I've always wanted to build a knowledge base of, you know, 50 state specific probate knowledge, but it's a massive undertaking. So that's what's most valuable to me in that partnership is they've actually taken on that expense and, and actually built that. So anywhere you are, it should be compatible. Um, Anthony said, I just started the course. Where do I find a state exec? I think it's in providing value first to earn referrals is the name of the module. And you'll see the, the lesson within that uh, title to state exec. There's one where I jabber on about it. And then there's one where uh, Matthew from a state exec actually shows you a how-to video of how to use it and get started. Pete, Mark, I see a hand up. How are you? Hi, Chad. How are you doing? Um, oh, wow. I just wanted to address the uh, state exec software. I used it once and I gave it to a client and he was ecstatic that I gave it to him. However, he hasn't started using it. It's just been sitting there. And I think he, I think, I don't think he's overwhelmed because he's an, he's an engineer type, but I think it's, overwhelming the amount of stuff that he has to enter in there to keep track of it. But it's still, it's still on a positive note. Uh, he's very happy with it. Uh, I think he used, there's a lot of information in there. Like you said, Chad, they have to, the lawyers have to repeat four or five, six times a day. Uh, he just went in there and read everything. He's doing it pro, he's doing it by himself. He doesn't have a, an attorney yet. Uh, however, the attorney that he's going to use, uh, I sent him, uh, uh, you know, a trial of an estate and he came back at me and said, well, if this thing's as good as, you know, you say it is, it's going to put me out of business. So my question, I guess, to you would be, how do I get around that and showing them exactly that it will enhance his, his business for his clients? So, Mr. Attorney, if you think the value of, of being in business is being an administrative processor, we should probably talk about some other ways I can help you with your, let's start with customer service. What if, what if you do that and you are actually able to take the, the surviving family members and put an estate plan in place for them with all the extra time you would have spent chasing paper? Can you monetize that service? then let's, let's focus on that. Let's remove the administrative drag from your business and let's make you more revenue by estate planning than estate administration. That would be my answer. You need to shift the mindset of the attorney. Like I said, be a small business owner, supporting a small business owner. He's caught, he's been in this loop of administrative horse shit for so many years. He thinks it's his job. He thinks it's why he went to law school. Well, he's, I mean, he's a one man show in his office. So he basically does everything. Exactly. So. And what do we call that? That's a shitty job, not a business. So let's just help him actually turn his shitty job into a business. Like he's, he's using something as a, as an objection. That's just showing what like the position he's in. Like he's a prime prospect to help get out of his own way by helping deal like you know, get with the times, use software that can help you be more, more, top, more, do use your time in a more dollar productive manner. And, you know, if I give you an extra five hours a day, what would you do with it? And he may sit around on Facebook and waste it, 
But what he should be doing is actually calling people and saying, hey, who do you know that doesn't have an estate plan and how can I help? And so shift his mindset. You can be, a, not, don't be as abrupt as I'm being here, but I'm trying to make a point. Like he's just, he's thinking about his business the wrong way. Okay. Thank you. I, I mean, he's, he's given me four or five referrals. So he's my prime referral attorney. It's just like you said, he's been in this circle so long. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Chad. Buy him a copy of Traction, the book. Okay. Gino Wickman's Traction and ask him to read that. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Larry Smith, how can we help you today? Hey, Chad. How you doing, bud? Doing well. Hey, a couple of questions. I got several here. Websites. Do you think I should spend much time working on websites? I mean, how much... I don't know if it's dollar productive. It's kind of getting your, your feed. I, I've got a, a all the leads website, but I know that's not generating any business. There's no SEO involved in that. But mm -hmm. just curious what your take is, if it's worth it, if it's something we should pursue. Not for most. Not for most. The amount that it takes, like it takes thousands of hours and thousands of dollars to build a really good website that, that attracts business in the probate space. There's very, very little search intent for the consumer looking for a real estate solution or anything. They're typically looking for attorneys and they don't find much there either. So search intent and search volume, search, search volume is very low across the country. Okay. A better way like is, is, have you taken the earn course? I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you heard me talk about building a community, like building a Facebook. Right. Honestly, at long term, that that's going to be a far more valuable asset in your local community than than a single website would be. I would recommend keeping your current website so you have somewhere to land traffic that can point back to the community. Yeah. Because when you go, when you enter, when you if you're not already, when you get yourself set up in a state exec. They're going to, in the checklist, they will, it will link out to your website and a scheduling page. When you put your, your profile in estateprofessional.org, have the website, you can also point to your groups. But if like, as far as, as, you know, potential return, I think an hour spent presenting a topic that's valuable to consumers in a Facebook group is going to be far, but it, it, over time, I think it's going to be more valuable than an hour spent writing okay. a blog post. It's just, it's, it's tough. It takes a, a long, long time to, to do. And it's, it, it's easy to wear yourself out trying to get there. So I would, I, like I said, I, I'm not suggesting you take your current website down and something's better than nothing. But as far as getting that thing to index and create inbound business, it's pretty tough to do. Yeah. Okay. Where with a community, you can do it in a matter of days. If if you have your vendor team and you have someone pitching every Tuesday night, presenting basically an hour long class to the community, to the public, then you create an archive that becomes discoverable. I think you'll get a lot further with the same amount of time and less mm -hmm. struggle. I'm trying to remember, there are some resources within ARM to create a Facebook Okay. Yeah, there's there's a module that that talks about. Okay. That I don't I don't do the app like like the exactly here's here's how I'll start to finish. But if you've ever engaged much with Facebook groups, it's pretty straightforward. The reason I didn't do a how to is because it's going to be obsolete in three months as soon as they make UI <laughs> changes, and I wasn't going to chase recreating that over and over and over. So. I really give you the concepts and, and the ideas and, and what to do, how to do, like what to do, not how to do it, because awesome. that's, that's going to change all the time. So I got a couple of quick questions uh, going to uh, best practices on call protocol. When you're calling the uh, petitioners, the PRs, do you have like a number of times you want to run through that inventory? What's too little? What's too much? Um just curious. By inventory, you mean the, the list well, of yeah. petitioners? Yeah, the old real estate term. I mean, yeah. in theory, we want to actually want to speak with 100% of them. That's incredibly difficult to do these mm -hmm. days. Like even with, you know, I have several friends that run call centers or contacts that I've spoken to. Contact rates are around 5% across the yeah. board. So you're going to fail 95% of the time. You're going to leave voicemails that never get returned. In theory, if you have the time and, and 
you know, you want to keep calling until you've spoken to all of them. Some of the most valuable leads in my almost decade of experience with this, the, the easiest to convert probate lead is the one who has ignored everybody's phone calls for the last three years. And your phone call creates a breakthrough. One of those son of a bitch, he just reminded me what I've been running away from. And then they actually engage with you and you can help do, you can just do, to have your team come in and do everything for them. They're, they're more submissive at that point. Not, not that that's, we're not looking for, but they, they know like every morning they wake up thinking, you know, I really, I really need to do that, but it's so painful. It's, you know, it's, it's such like, I've created this, this block, but I'm not going to do it today. And I've, honestly, I've gotten calls from people that have my letters hanging on their refrigerators for two and three years. Mm. And man, when they made the decision, it, it happened in days, house empty, house on the market, house sold. So if you, if you have the time, you know, to go back through those lists, just keep calling until they say, you know, no, or please help me. We've, we've, we've done nothing. So okay. I realize how challenging that is. This compounds very quickly. If you have a hundred people yeah. a month at the end of the year, you got 1200. And if you didn't, didn't keep notes and constantly keep in touch with them. You don't know which 1200 have sold, which ones haven't, where they're at in the process. It's, you know, that's, that's a challenging thing. That's why, you know, the earn course is, is really, uh, is it's for, and myself included, nobody can prospect hardcore all the day in and day out every day. Like just based on that, that's, that's too general of a statement. Mm -hmm. People who are really good at, at, at being real estate professionals oftentimes don't have the, the willpower, tenacity to do that every day. There's obviously people who do that as their primary you know, job. ISAs can do that every day. But us, we're typically visionary entrepreneurs. <laughs> like we, we chase, <laughs> chase something new. We're, we're reading six books at the same damn time. And it's just usually not sustainable for us to, to hammer the phones eight hours a day, you know, day in day out for five years yeah. unless you're a mike ferry you know follower you're probably not doing that so what earn is is an opportunity for you instead of you know being down on yourself and quitting it's an opportunity to kind of switch like okay i'm gonna work attorneys well that's getting exhausting i'm gonna go work with personal reps well i got my ass handed to me no one's answering the phone i'm gonna go talk to attorneys so for me like quite honestly and candidly it's an opportunity for me to present a different approach to get the same result for the consumer and for your business. But instead of people getting to the point where they're burnout on the phones or with direct mail and quitting, mm -hmm. it's like, let's try a different approach. Let's, let's mm -hmm. go B to, let's go B to B and serve the same clients. So that's what I would recommend is hit the phones when you can hit the attorneys when you're tired of it. And mm -hmm. uh, like, you'll, you'll do well if you're doing both. Yeah, so that was my take on it. It seems like, you know, with where I'm at, you can't represent yourself. So, so many of the people that I have talked to, so the education has been that they are they are relying heavily on the attorney's lead and almost all of it. Are you in Texas? Yeah, I'm in Texas. Yeah. So it, it seems like that is the ultimate play is just to stay marketing and working with attorneys i'll tell you it's the path of least resistance because you can you know you can you can do more less work in a more professional manner and get the same amount of business and what i mean by that is you can spend i mean if you if as you've watched brian's interview he took the course in two days he set appointments in one day and went two days i think it was i think it was about a five-day timeline to have six inbound referrals how many of us have gotten six deals from prospecting a cold probate list in their first five days? Mm -mm, no. So like it's, it's a way to, it's just working at a higher level. There are fewer people who are going to have the courage and the level of professionalism and ethics to approach an attorney with something valuable. So we almost have no competition. And it's pretty cool when these attorneys are like, holy shit, no one's ever asked me that. No one's ever, no one's ever offered to do anything like that for my business. And you got them like, it's a lifetime relationship. As long as you, you know, really listen to what they have to say in that course, like they want to make sure we, 
even if we're not a fiduciary to the to the their client, they are, and they want to see that transferred. They want that level of customer service and and legal you know legal responsibility. So it's it's higher level work that honestly requires less work to get the same or better result than prospecting the families. If we are going to call the the personal reps, we call them executors or executrix here, but. Uh, number of rings, uh, number of voicemails, uh, Bill Gross, I talked to him. He's not a big voicemail guy. I know that when you were with all the leads, you recommended doing that, or maybe it was Bruce Hill that did. No, uh, it's me. I like when I first started this and what, you know, the system that all the leads, what we taught there really came out of my efforts. And I, you know, at the time, Mary Lou Tyler that wrote Predictable Revenue, she was using my business as kind of a case study and I tracked every KPI. The first 12,000 pieces of mail and the first 12,000 phone calls made, like I tracked all that and really mm. like that was, that was my test case. I basically took a year's worth of data and or the first year's worth of data and just followed it through meticulously. And I mean, mega mm. geeked out on it. So a lot of the things that, that, and, and, you know, I taught Bruce, I, I brought Bruce into this. Uh, we met around that time and he was leaving Roanoke and transitioning into Raleigh. So I didn't see him as competition. So I was like, Hey, let me show you how I became, you know, I did 52 deals my first year in a market where you did 20 and it was probate was my answer. Like I, you know, I, I found a, a niche. I found my blue ocean and I made myself valuable. So Bruce and I started to work through this. He's done a ton of testing too, as he got his feet under him in Raleigh. What I've found is I, I, no, I no longer look at voicemail as a sales tool. Voicemail is simply a branding impression. It's almost useless to put a, a call to action, but we're going to try it anyway. So for me, I tested over a dozen voicemail scripts. And then I tracked the response and I did this through live calling. I did this through ringless voicemail, but what I found to be the most effective message is, Hey, this is Chad. I sent you a letter last week, had a couple minutes in the office today. Just wanted to see if I could catch you, you know, give me a shout when you have a chance and uh five, 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 one, two, three, four. That is you now, if, if you leave a vague message like that, you do need to be prepared for the callback. They're going to be on edge. They'll be up on the balls of their feet defensive because you were very vague. And they're like, well, who the hell is Chad? And what the hell does he do? Which to me is awesome because they're not in a behavioral pattern in their brain. I'm actually speaking to their prefrontal cortex as soon as I pick up the phone. So they're like, who are you? Why did you call me? And I'm like, yes, you might be aggressive, but you're engaged. And that's really the point of being on the phone is to have an engaged person on the other end. So for me, I liked it. If you're, if you're weak, if you're timid, if you don't believe in what you're doing, you'll probably get your ass chewed out a few times by doing that. But that, that was to me, the, the way that I could get the most return phone calls. And that was at that, you know, that when I was really meticulously tracking all this was in 2015, 16, mm -hmm. I had a 2% callback rate. So I failed 98% of the time, but I saw those 98% of voicemails left as a branding impression. You know, it was different than what everybody else was saying because everyone else is trying to sell on voicemail. Hi, my name's Chad with ABC Real Estate. I, I'm one of the top agents in this market. I focus on these zip codes. And I noticed that you have, you're the executor of a state and you might need blah, blah. Like it's, it's, a, it's a different voicemail. And all I want to do is get them to look, right? If they go look for the letter that I sent or if they go look for my online reputation, then it's a branding impression. So for me, it's worth the two seconds or, you know, it's worth the five seconds that it takes me to leave a brief message, knowing that 2% of the time I might get an abrasive callback that I can turn into a really great conversation. Because what I found about the callbacks is, and you've got to peel the layers of the onion, but the people who call back, they are in, they're feeling a struggle. And they want to know their curiosity is what made them call back. Even if they call back and say, you son of a bitch, you sent me three letters. And I, I, I told someone in your office, don't you be that. It's like, interesting. Like, help me understand why you would have called today. You could have just thrown that in the mail and not spent all this emotional energy on this call, call them to the carpet. Mm, and job, you'll, you'll find the biggest, toughest ones will crack and be all gooey in the center. And they'll be like, 
damn it, dude, I just can't do this anymore. These people are driving me crazy. And then you empathize with them. Yeah. Like, I know. That's why I have the courage to do it the way I do it, because I can actually help you if you give me a chance. What tomorrow around one or three, which time is better? Yeah. And like, be direct on those. Mm -hmm. So the ones that call back as hard asses are usually the ones begging for help the most. You just, it takes skill to get through. You've got to pierce the armor of the ego so you can talk to the person. So that's, that's kind of my take on, on voicemail. What I've learned over time, it's worth doing. As far as frequency is the, the next part of yeah. that question people usually ask. Yeah. If you're if you're a tenacious prospector and you're calling the same list every day, don't leave a voicemail every time. <laughs> yeah. Like my rule of thumb is one voicemail every two weeks is reasonable. If you're leaving one, you know, more often than that, and these people are really in deep grieving, you can become a thorn in their side. Once a yeah. month is certainly reasonable. Once every two weeks would be my maximum. Unless something shifts in the marketplace, a buyer comes up like a, a very specific reason that you're reaching out to them. And then the frequency could be daily. You know, listen, I, I've noticed the door was kicked in on the, on 123 Walnut Street. And according to Texas state law, they, you now have a, a landlord tenant relationship. I have notified the sheriff and asked him to patrol the neighborhood, but I need you to call me back. Like that's something you leave a voicemail every damn day until you're talking to them and you get a lot of credit for being the one that, you know, help minimize the damage that, that could have been done. So there's exceptions to it, but if it's just a general prospecting voicemail once a month, twice a month, max. Gotcha. So you come from the school of having some emotion is better than no emotion. When you get those angry callbacks, that's, that means they care. It does. I know a lot of people don't think of it that way, but they do. Typically, it means they're, they're very ego-driven. They don't have a strong level of self-awareness. But if you know how to deal with that, and if not, there's some really good books on that. Uh, Ryan Holiday wrote a book called Ego is the Enemy. Chris Voss, his book, Never Split the Difference, will actually teach you some skills on how to manage those personalities. Tony Robbins the, I think the best sales course ever made was Tony Robbins Mastering Influence. It really it teaches you to focus on the people. And as you always hear me say, it's people and situation. We'll get the real estate. That's hell, that's the easy part. We already know how to do that. If we can be professionals, like if we can understand how people think and what what feelings and what emotions drive their actions, then we can really, really be skilled salespeople. So study the ego, like in, in the clinical sense, not that you often hear ego means overconfidence. It's not really that. It's it's that part of our, it's that little voice in our head that says in that scenario, this son of a bitch is trying to steal my mom's house and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And what he's showing you is this big, tough facade of, you know, I've had people say, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of your office. The guy drove all the way across town to come kick my ass one day. And how I turned him into a buyer, like I, he was on my investor, list, my cash buyer list, but all he needed was someone to talk to. Like he was hurting and he hadn't been able to vent that out because his ego was showing the world this tough guy. And when he met a tougher guy, he became putty and he was just a good guy. But his, what his ego was telling him is present the world with this rough and tough redneck that'll kick ass and take names by God. But once I cracked him, he was actually a really professional dude and he had cash and he was afraid to buy a foreclosure house. And I got him to start talking about his fears. Mm. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't mind those abrasive inbounds or even if I'm outbounding and they get abrasive because then I know I got something right. Like there's right. some pain in there that I know I can help heal if they'll let me. And they won't all let you. Some people no. are just, you know, they just aren't. Some people are just have a really low EQ and just want to bitch and complain about everything. But the ones that are asking for help sometimes do it in a desperate way and I have fun with them. Mm. Good stuff. Chad, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, great questions. Elvis, how can we help you, sir? Hey, Chad. Good afternoon. Thank you. So I'm still going through the course and I wanted to ask you briefly if we're going to pick out a certain area that we're going to send out letters to are you focused on a, like a, a radius 50 miles 10 miles or 100 leads per month that you're going to start depends on what market are you in los angeles 
it's a big county, man. I mean, it's it's six hours across the county, right? So it's it's probably not feasible for you to work all of LA County. I would either work geographically or demographically where you would prefer to do business. So if you do better in a certain community of people or a certain net worth, focus on that. Or if you just don't want to drive more than an hour, draw that circle and focus on that geography. But wow. it, it's kind of personal. It comes down to you. Like, you know, death isn't picky. It, it doesn't matter. It's 3,149 counties and over 30,000 zip codes. The Grim Reaper visits them all. So there's people going through this no matter where you are. It's kind of choosing who you want to help. I guess I was more concerned of the mail outs that are going to go out to these people. You for sure recommended three months, right? But if we can do 12 months, even better. Yeah. And that's kind of the way I was looking at it. Like, you know, I, I can easily pick out 300 leads a month to start sending them out letters. But um, maybe, maybe this will help you. So for me, like in all that tracking that I was talking about earlier, I tracked the, the first 12,000. What I found is I could convert 6% of a cold list over a quarter over a three month period. So roughly 2% per month per list. Now those would obviously overlap and begin to compound and I would mark it for three months. But over that quarter, I could count on 2% of that list actually doing business with me. So in your case, if it was 300, you would have 300 to first month, 300 to second month. And then at, at month three, you would hit the critical mass, or you said month 12. I mean, your critical mass would be 3,600 phone calls, 3,600 letters, and obviously they roll off if you're managing your list correctly and you're using a CRM and indicating the ones that said, no, I already sold it. There is no real estate, whatever. Then those numbers come down over time, but it's a pretty, it's a big budget. Like if you're going to do 3,600 pieces in month 12, like just look at your budget. There's in the probate mastery course, one of the handouts is a calculator I developed in my own business years ago. Have you seen that? The probate ROI calculator? Yeah. So you can use that to kind of, to set a proper expectation for your budget and your ROI. That's why I built that tool. I chose to focus on two counties with 120 leads per month. Mm -hmm. And that, that yielded me, you know, uh, enough to, well, it just, the, if I would have had a third county that had the same similar lead counts and demographics, I would have taken on another one. I feel like I could have easily handled 200. I've seen people handle, you know, Cook County, Illinois, Los Angeles, Maricopa. Those are the three biggest in the, in the country. And I've seen people like individuals able to actually take those entire markets and handle them and get the work done. It's mm -hmm. pretty rare. Like it's a hell of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at your budget, look at your time and make your decision. But I think you can easily manage 200 a month. Yeah. Okay. And then regarding the calling, how often do you call new leads? Like the first five days and then every two weeks? So, and I've spent a lot of time working with folks from LA. You've got attorneys there who are selling the list for, it's a very low barrier to entry to get data in Los Angeles County. So you've got much more noise on the phones and in the mailbox in LA than you do in most markets making it really tough. You've got to differentiate yourself in the first four seconds of the phone call. What makes you different? Because they have, in my experience in LA, they've developed a pattern and they know how to run people off. Nope. We got it handled. Our attorney's taking care of it. And that's the most common one you're going to hear, or they're just not going to answer because they've heard from 17 wholesalers who have, have battered them up. I would say, be careful not to discourage yourself because working the phones in LA is, is a really hard road to hope. You're, you're likely to find faster success than a higher return by working with attorneys on your particular market, just because you have so much noise out there. And I think, I know for people in LA County on this call, I think people would agree with me. It's, it's a tough market to work. And using things like attorney relationships, community Facebook groups, in-person meetups, that, that help families going through this, a different offer to, to punch through all that noise and actually show them something they haven't seen before is going to be your approach. My advice would have been different in 2011 or 12, but there's a bunch of lists floating around that are real cheap in your market and a bunch of people who 
barely know what probate is trying to get deals and they're making it harder for everybody. So I would focus more on what you've learned in the earn course than probate mastery. If you want to have any of that beautiful hair left in five years. <laughs> Thank you. Is that what happened to you, Chad? <laughs> it is. This is what probate don't <laughs> probate the wrong way. <laughs> All right. Kim, how can we help you today? Hi, Chad. I've kind of been lingering and watching all of your videos but not actually been a live call just gonna admit that i kind of got scared because i tried a bunch of different things and it didn't really work like went to the courthouse and they said they weren't allowed to provide lists and then i called all the leads i'm in colorado by the mm -hmm. way and then all the leads said they weren't allowed to provide the lists until after the probate had happened and then i networked with I actually got two attorneys to meet with me in person, and I feel like it went relatively well, but I'm only a year into the real estate industry in general, and mm -hmm. then I've never done a probate deal, so I feel like it just kind of like crashed and burned because I didn't really have any experience to kind of give them. Okay. Well, thanks for being here, and thanks for stepping up. What you'll find in this community is we've got Lynette in Denver and Dave Gwynn, also in Denver, both on this call right now. Both have been working one of the toughest markets in the entire country for, hell, you guys have been here for years at this point. So it can be done. I will say that Colorado is the toughest state I've ever coached in because of the way the data is recorded. Mm -hmm. There is a way to gain access to it. You can pay $5 per record and get the data on petition, but it, it's very costly. Right. I think you should, what, what county are you in? What city? And I'm county? in Larimer County, like Fort Collins up north. Okay. So you're not in direct competition with these two. I do know that I coached a Mike Ferry student in Larimer, Weld, and what's another surrounding county? Larimer, Weld. I mean, There's another county right there. We did three counties. Okay. He was a Mike Ferry guy. He kept a spreadsheet for every action he took in his business on a daily basis, which was super helpful for me. What we found in four months of tenacious day-to-day -day prospecting, tracking KPIs, nothing, 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 nothing. He came back to me. I said, "You," and this is when I was maybe in year two of building all the leads. And I said, Fred, here's the deal. I never want to be the guy that's taking money from you. I want to be the guy that's getting you a return. So stop, stop paying for a subscription. Stop buying leads until we get a positive ROI. And then you can make a decision whether that makes sense to start back up again. In the next eight weeks, so that, remember, this is four months under the story. He had three counties. I think his total, the total leads per month in those three were probably around 150 leads. We did four deals in, a, I think it was a three or four day period. Mm -hmm. It was in month six, the people he was reaching out to in month one came to him and they were ready to roll. They did business. And I think it was the median price in that market at the time was like mid fours, which is showing how old this story is, right? But Fred did, he, he ended up doing four transactions off of those, those first four lists. We did four transactions in a week and, and all like at once. So what I've found in Colorado is it, it's a longer game because mm -hmm. you've got a lot of investors are skip tracing obituaries. They're pulling obituaries, skip tracing every known family member and hammering those people. I have actually seen people petition on behalf of, of like for the estate, which is not technically illegal, but I wouldn't say is the most ethical thing. Like people opening estates before the family can. I've seen that happen in Colorado yeah. twice now. So it's a tough market. However, you've got people like Dave Gwynn who works that market and works a remote market. He works virtually a market in Florida. You've got Lynette has really found her groove in the higher net worth crowd in Colorado. And she's found some really interesting opportunities to help people. So what I would say is lean on the community like you are now, but get to know these folks, discuss ideas, go buy them beer. Like that goes a long ways in real estate. People love beer in real estate. <laughs> But it's it's more difficult, I think. Have you taken the earn course? Not yet. I just took probate mastery. So that's something that 
again, because of the market you're in and, and the specifics and my experience there, you're probably better off just really, really helping the attorneys around that market, help mm -hmm. them, you know, do less work and get more business than they ever have. And that'll be your niche. Like you'll, you'll be their gal. So look at, you know, follow what the, some of the ideas in this course and focus on the attorneys, using the attorneys to reach the consumers. And I'll, I'll just give you some insight into my advice. You've, you've been, you're willing to be vulnerable in front of this community and, and somewhat admit failure or feeling like you failed. That takes a lot of courage and, and thank you for doing that. Like that's, that's an important part of, of this being valuable for all of us. My advice would be different if you came in with with more strength and be like, hey, I've done A, B, and C, and all I care is give me D. I'm gonna I'm ready to go try. Like if you had a I'm ready to run through walls attitude, my advice may be a little different. But I think considering where you're at and some of the self-talk that I can see in you, you should go give yourself like this is gonna be easier, it's gonna be more rewarding, and then come back to consumer prospecting later whenever you've got some confidence. I would also encourage you to not give a shit about how many years you've been in the business. There's an 88% failure rate within three years. Most people in this business aren't professional to begin with or when they fail. So it's not ever going to serve you to, to say, well, I'm new. Like, don't be timid. Find, find, like, find a level of professionalism you can be proud of. And when someone says, how many years you've been on the in the business? Help me understand why you asked that question is your response. Don't answer. They help me understand why that's important to you and put it back on them, turn the table and use their own psychology against them. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in the business. What matters? Do you, do you deliver on what you promise? Do you do it in an ethical manner? That's all that matters in this business. So like I'm asking you to get like first acknowledge that you've got some stinking thinking and it's not serving you and it won't ever. So get rid of that. Next, I'll say, go, go do what's in, in the earn course because you're, you're less likely to face harsh rejection or spend hours and hours and hours falling on your face and in your market. And I think that you'll get like a renewed confidence and some pride in this, and that'll fuel you to go back into that game of direct prospecting. Awesome. Well, thank you That's so That's why much. I gave you the advice I did. Thank you. Winston. How are you? Hey, Chad, how you doing? Long time no see. Do you ever leave the damn beach? I mean... <laughs> well, I live in Southern California, but I used to live on a tropical island for two years, so it's it's in my blood there. But what I wanted to tell you guys real quick here, Chad, is this goes back probably six months ago, and you were talking that day and encouraging us to, you know, putting our finances together to buy some of these probate leads that we're working on, some of their properties, and you were getting questions about financing and, you know, lines of credit and HELOC, you know, came up in discussion. And you recommended a bank that I had never, ever heard of here in Southern California, First Citizens Bank. A couple of months went by and I actually found that there was one about five minutes from my house that was brand new. They had bought out some old bank and I thought, you know, wouldn't be a bad idea to have this just in case I have an opportunity or something comes up. I just wanted to tell everybody here that if they contact First Citizens Bank, and I know they're growing all across the country, they just arranged a, a, a nice HELOC for me, and they didn't bury me in documentation requests. It was more make sense underwriting. They did it fairly quickly, and I found them to be very good to work with. So I want to encourage if anybody's looking for a line of credit to help in their business or help buy properties, contact for citizens. I've got a great contact. They can contact me and I'll introduce them. They do them back east out of North Carolina, but they're great to work with. And I, I got a good number for them. Yeah. Well, thanks for that validation. I, you know, I'm, I'm not one to ever promote big banks. I really love community banks, but what I love about them is they now have, last time I looked at their, their financials, $111 billion on the balance sheet, but they still act like a community bank. And the last loan I did with them was a, a home improvement loan, uncollateralized. I think it was a one, I didn't even, there wasn't even an application. I filled out a personal financial statement. It cleared, I think they charged me $75 was, was the fee. 
and it was 3.49% on eight year amortization, 50,000 bucks, no questions asked. Like, I'm, like not even recorded on the real estate. And I'm like, you're giving money away at that. Hell yeah, I'll take it. And then on the HELOCs, if you have over, and first citizens, if you're listening, I hope my memory serves me. I think it's over a 750 credit score. You can go to an 89.9 .9 LTV. And that's typically at prime plus prime plus a quarter, I believe, is the terms. And it's a, a ten year, fifteen year, as so ten years to actually draw on the line, fifteen to repay it. Phenomenal line of like home equity line of credit, one of the best available in the country. And they usually do desktop appraisals, and they can approve you within a day or two. And just like Winston said, it's no BS. I mean, a lot of people out here complain. I've been trying to get a HELOC done for weeks or months, and I'm like. No, it takes minutes with First Citizens, and they'll do a, almost a 90 LTV. So pretty hard to beat uh, on home lending. And also on the business side, I've I've told this story a lot, but there's some new faces here. I mean, <clears throat> with this entity in particular, the Magnum Opus Project, I, in three weeks, sold a company, bought a co or started a company, so rented a house, moved into an RV, and I just breezed in with an EIN number that was about 15 minutes old. Move. I seeded the company with twenty thousand bucks. Got a seventy-five thousand dollar credit card and a, a fifty thousand dollar, forty-nine thousand nine hundred dollar business line of credit, and was out in less than a half hour. Brand new company, no credit history, nothing. And there's lots and lots of people on YouTube that'll tell you you can't do that. You have to establish business credit. What you have to establish is a banking relationship and understand putting money into a deposit account. Because of the beautiful world of fractional reserve banking, you're giving them nine to one leverage on your money interest free. So if you put 20 grand down, they can loan 200,000. So to put 20 grand down and ask for 50 back is really not asking for much. They're in the business of loaning money and they don't actually have to pay for their money. It's for the most part. So don't like, don't feel like you're, you're unfinanceable until you've actually gone into a bank like this and put some money on deposit and ask for a relationship on the commercial side of the bank. You'll be surprised. So I'm glad you did that, Winston. That's awesome. So one little tidbit here as well, Chad. On the HELOCs, again, they were very, very minimal on costs. But the one big tip I can give you guys is that they don't do a tri-merge credit report. They only look at your Equifax. So make sure that thing is strong. Like Chad said, get it up into the sevens as high as you can. And it'll get you a better deal. Yep. Larry had a question. Does First Citizens do DSCR? So that's debt service coverage ratio. And they will look at on the commercial side. Yes, they do portfolio loans. So if as long I think their current requirements is 1.3 DSCR on on a commercial on the commercial side. And I, if I remember right, I haven't done one in a bit, but you need two months of, of rent roll uh, is all they need to, to prove your, your debt service coverage ratio. All right. Well, guys, this has been a fun call. It's fun to come back and guest every once in a while. Thanks for having me. I love, love seeing people who have been here for years coming back and still engaged in the community and uh, the, the new faces too. So, Kim, thanks for being here. Let's make it a habit. Turn that camera on and let us know how things are going. You took a big step today. We're proud of you. But thank you guys thank so you. much for this. Love being a part of it. Uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Chad.